This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. In this month's series, I'm covering cases in which the perpetrators created videos of their crimes and shared them with the world in real time. This week, I'll detail the case of a mass shooting that, to this day, is the worst criminal attack in New Zealand's history. A young man's racist ideology leads him to take the lives of 51 people and injure dozens more, all while recording and uploading video of the killings to Facebook Live. This is the last chapter in the series, Live Streamed Crimes the case of the Christchurch mosque attacks. The silver 2005 Subaru Outback drove through the streets of Rickerton, a suburb of Christchurch, New Zealand, on Friday afternoon, March 15, 2019. The driver was dressed all in black, He wore a tactical vest, black fingerless gloves, and a helmet to which he'd attached a GoPro camera. He switched the camera on as he drove towards the Al Noor Mosque at the edge of town. He also switched on the portable speaker he'd attached to his tactical vest, which began playing military-type anthems, including the British Grenadiers, a military marching song, and Remove Kebab, a Serb nationalist and anti-Muslim propaganda song. He parked his car in front of the mosque at 1.40 p.m. and exited the vehicle. It was Friday afternoon, and about 190 people, mostly men, were already inside attending afternoon prayer. As he approached the front entrance, he must have cut a curious figure the way he was dressed, and the fact that at his side, he carried a Mossberg 930 semi-automatic shotgun. Still, a man standing outside the front door to welcome visitors called out a friendly greeting. Hello, brother, the man said. The following several terrifying minutes were recorded by the man, 28-year-old Brenton Harrison Tarrant. The events were live-streamed as they unfolded from his GoPro camera connected to an app on his cell phone. Before he had even reached the mosque's front entrance, the gunman fired his semi-automatic weapon multiple times, killing the greeter at the front door. He then entered the mosque's prayer hall, where dozens of worshippers were gathered. The gunman opened fire, striking multiple people in just seconds. He was an experienced shooter and had customized the weapon by adding a sight and a buttstock, as well as modifying the trigger for accuracy and speed. Three men were killed just inside the entrance. Then the shooter moved into the large prayer hall and took aim at several more people. Dr. Naeem Rashid leaped into action to try and stop the bloodbath, bravely charging at the shooter. He was shot and also killed. The shooter continued on, aiming and firing as people ducked for cover and tried to escape or stay out of the sight of the gunman. He was methodical and calculated in his approach, sometimes shooting victims multiple times, sometimes quickly moving on to his next target. After several minutes, he left the building and returned to his car. But if survivors thought they might have miraculously been spared from further danger, they were wrong. The gunman retrieved another weapon from his vehicle and began shooting at fleeing worshippers who had made it as far as the parking lot. He then re-entered the mosque and continued firing on others, some of whom already lay wounded. Exiting the building once more, he fired upon a woman killing her before getting into his car. As he drove off, he continued shooting at people who were on foot and inside their cars. Approximately five minutes had passed since the shooting first began, and police were already on their way, alerted by several people who'd frantically called emergency services. The first patrol cars arrived just as the shooter was driving off, but his car was obscured by a large bus, so he got away unseen. He drove the Subaru at high speeds through Christchurch, first heading east on Beasley Avenue. He had a second destination in mind and was determined to get there as fast as possible, exceeding speeds of 130 kilometers or 81 miles an hour, while driving recklessly, weaving in and out of traffic. At 1.52 p.m., He arrived at the Linwood Islamic Center, located just about 5 kilometers or 3 miles east of the Al Noor Mosque. The live stream video had ended just a minute before he arrived, but the GoPro camera attached to his helmet continued to record. 
The small building that housed the Linwood Islamic Center was surrounded by a fence and accessed by a narrow driveway. The shooter left his car parked in the driveway just beyond the fence, blocking any cars from entering or exiting the property. The center, like the mosque, was filled with worshippers gathered for afternoon prayer. The shooter grabbed another weapon, one that was equipped with a strobe light to disorient victims, and walked up to the building. However, the entrance to the building was not located on the side closest to the street, but in the back. Unable to quickly find the entrance, frustrated and most likely aware that police were hot on his trail, the shooter began firing through the building's windows. Worshippers were taken completely by surprise. Four people were killed immediately, and others were injured. Chaos erupted as people attempted to hide, flee to safety, or attend to the injured and dying. The shooter then returned to his vehicle to retrieve another weapon. Abdul Aziz Wahabzada followed the gunman outside and picked up an empty shotgun dropped by the shooter. He took cover behind cars in the parking lot and tried to redirect the shooter's attention towards himself and away from the building and the other worshippers. I'm here, he called out, but the shooter ignored him and re-entered the building where he fired more shots, killing three more people. Less than five minutes after arriving, the shooter drove away. The sirens of police vehicles arriving after being alerted to a second mass shooting could be heard in the distance. Two minutes after leaving the mosque, the Subaru was spotted by a patrol car and a chase began. Dozens of police vehicles joined in, and within two minutes, one rammed into the shooter's vehicle, forcing it up onto a curb and into a pole. Eighteen minutes after the first attack began at the al Nor Mosque, Brenton Tarrant was arrested and taken into custody. He'd murdered 51 people and injured dozens of others in what was the worst act of mass violence ever recorded in New Zealand's history. Brenton Harrison Tarrant was taken alive by Christchurch police after shooting and killing 51 people in two separate mass shootings. 44 were killed at the Al Noor Mosque, seven at the Linwood Islamic Center. Most were men and all were Muslim worshippers. Forty more people were injured in the shootings. He had live-streamed the shootings, distributing them via the Facebook Live app. About 12 minutes after the live stream ended, Complaints began to be reported to Facebook about the graphic content of the 17-minute long video. It had been viewed 4,000 times before it was taken down by Facebook. At the same time the video was live-streamed, the shooter had scheduled a 74-page manifesto titled The Great Replacement to be emailed to 30 separate government officials and media outlets. The manifesto, as well as Terrence's confession to the police, was filled with a hodgepodge of racist, anti-immigrant, and anti-Muslim sentiments. His ideology adhered to white supremacist rhetoric regarding white genocide conspiracy theories, the call for all non-European immigrants to be deported, etc., while at the same time pointedly stating that he was, quote, not a Nazi. Instead, he identified himself as an ethno-nationalist, an eco-fascist, and a kebab removalist, a reference to his support for the genocide of Bosnian Muslims during the Bosnian War. He also blamed violent video games, which he'd played since his preteen years, as an additional factor for his act of multiple murder, although some would interpret this as sarcasm. The investigation into the mosque attacks would reveal that, over the span of a decade, Terrence's racist views advanced to the point of extremist hatred. He immersed himself in alt-right internet forums on 4chan and 8chan, followed right-wing YouTube channels, and found other content that fueled his belief that Western civilization was facing annihilation by Muslim terrorists. In the decade preceding the attacks, he had traveled extensively to France, Spain, Serbia, Bosnia, and Croatia, and spent an extended amount of time visiting Turkey in the year before committing the mass shootings. During many of these trips, he'd been in contact with far-right organizations, attending meetings, meeting members, and donating to extremist causes. Tarrant, born in New South Wales, Australia, moved to Dunedin in New Zealand in 2017. According to his confession and evidence gathered by investigators, he began planning the mosque attacks from the time he arrived. Between 2017 and 2018, he purchased no less than 10 firearms, which included semi-automatic rifles and semi-automatic shotguns, and over 7,000 rounds of ammunition.
He also purchased firearms components to modify these weapons, adding sights to assist accuracy, modifying triggers for lighter trigger pressure and faster trigger resets when firing, adding an ambidextrous charging handle to one of the semi-automatic weapons to make cocking the firearm easier, adding a bipod to a bolt-action rifle to increase accuracy, and adding a strobe light to one of the semi-automatic firearms to disorient his targets. He joined two gun clubs that he visited regularly to practice target shooting. Even with all his firearms expertise, Terrence still managed to accidentally shoot himself in July of 2018. He was injured when a metal fragment lodged in his right eye and thigh. He told the hospital emergency department registrar that a round of ammunition had exploded while he was cleaning his rifle barrel. The metal fragment was removed from his eye and he was given antibiotics and a tetanus shot. An x-ray showed a small metal fragment was lodged in his thigh, but doctors decided it didn't warrant surgery as it was unlikely to cause any further issues. Emergency room attendants didn't notify police about this incident, chalking it up to a simple accident. Taryn had also reported to his landlord the same story of how the accident occurred, afraid that someone had heard the shot and reported it to the landlord anyway. The bullet hole lodged in the wall of Terrence's apartment was repaired, and no further questions were asked. Terrence said he'd considered not going to the hospital for treatment, worried that questions would be raised, but he was more concerned about his eyesight and decided to take the risk and receive treatment. He admitted to investigators that he'd also planned to hit a third target that day at a mosque located 90 kilometers away in Ashburton. He intended to burn down the building, and upon his arrest, police found four modified containers filled with flammable liquid in his car. Another strange detail of the mosque attacks was that Tarrant covered his weapons and magazines with words written in white marker. The words on the graffitied guns referred to historical conflicts between Muslims and European Christians, battles, wars, and conflicts fought in these ideological fights, as well as the names of Islamic terrorist attack victims, white supremacist slogans, and a Slavic swastika symbol. In his first appearance in court the day after his arrest, Brendan Tarrant was cocky and defiant, grinning at reporters and using a white power hand gesture. New Zealand's contempt rules kept information and details about the shooter under wraps from the public and the media to some extent. The media was allowed to photograph and film the defendant on the condition that his face would be pixelated before being broadcast. His name was not often mentioned by the court or media, with news sources in New Zealand simply referring to him as the alleged shooter or the defendant. New Zealand's justice system's contempt rules were enacted to ensure defendants received a fair trial, especially in the case of high-profile trials. The added bonus for the public was that perpetrators of high-profile crimes didn't become name-recognized celebrities, which some claim can lead to copycat crimes. If you've noticed, I've tried to do the same in this episode, referring to him most often as the shooter. He was charged with one count of murder while the investigation was ongoing, and the case transferred to the high court. His lawyer did not seek bail. He was transferred to Auckland Prison, which housed the country's only maximum security unit. On April 4th, the total number of charges was increased to 89. 50 were for murder and 39 for attempted murder. A month later, a new charge was added. Tarrant was charged with engaging in a terrorist attack under New Zealand's Terrorism Suppression Act of 2002. In addition, one more charge of murder and one of attempted murder was added. A mental health assessment of the defendant was ordered and completed, but doctors concluded that Tarrant was competent to stand trial and the trial date was set for June 2, 2020. On March 25th, the defendant communicated through his lawyers that he planned to change his plea from not guilty on all charges to guilty. On March 26, he appeared via audiovisual link from prison and pled guilty to all 92 charges. The judge accepted his plea and remanded him in custody to await his sentence. The public was still mourning over the mass shooting of innocent worshippers by a hate-filled and racist attacker in what was called one of New Zealand's darkest days. Prior to the March 15, 2019 mosque attacks in Christchurch, New Zealand had been considered one of the safest and most inviting places to live, with a diverse population and people of many ethnicities and religions coexisting peacefully. 
In fact, in 2019, just before the attacks were committed, it had been named the second most peaceful country in the world by Global Peace Index. So the public wanted to know, how did this happen and why here? A Royal Commission report to look thoroughly into what led up to the attacks was undertaken by New Zealand's government to answer these questions. It painted a portrait of a young man, a loner, who immersed himself in dangerous and mind-warping conspiracies. A steady diet of this rhetoric led him to take violent action in which he saw himself as a hero for his hate-filled cause. The video recording and live streaming of the attacks, therefore, were meant to preserve for posterity what in Terence warped mind was a necessary and historical act. The killer's family would express shock upon learning that Tarrant was responsible for over 50 murders, but the Royal Commission report would uncover several red flags from the shooter's life that may have contributed to his ultimate violent actions. Brenton Harrison Tarrant grew up in Grafton, New South Wales, Australia. He had one sister named Lauren. His parents, Rodney and Sharon Tarrant, separated when he was 9 or 10 years old. His mother reported that the children found the divorce difficult. Brenton especially was affected, becoming withdrawn and clingy, according to Sharon. Other traumatic events also occurred early in Tarrant's life, including the death of his grandfather and the family home burning down. He began to suffer from social anxiety and didn't socialize well with other children. Her son became such a loner at this time that his parents allowed him to spend time playing video games to keep him occupied. He would later say that he began playing online role-playing games and first-person shooter games at the age of six or seven. His internet activities were largely unsupervised. After his parents separated, his mother entered into a new relationship with a man who was abusive to both her and her children. The relationship concluded with Sharon seeking an apprehended violence order against her boyfriend, the equivalent of a restraining order in the U.S. Lauren and then Brenton would move in with their father during this time. As a preteen, Brenton put on weight and as a result was bullied by some of his classmates. Investigators discovered that he'd only had two friends in high school, with whom he spent time only sporadically. After the age of 14, most of his relationships were conducted solely online. He reported to his mother in 2017 that he'd begun chatting with others over the 4chan internet message board at the age of 13 or 14. 4chan is an image board website that was primarily used by young males between the ages of 18 and 25 to discuss anime and was originally created as an answer to Japan's 2chan. All images and discussions on 4chan can be shared anonymously, as 4chan users need not register to access it. Tarrant began using 4chan to connect with others over video game playing, but he would become exposed to far right-wing messaging on the site soon afterward. Tarrant was twice called out by his high school teachers regarding his racist views. Once, he made racist comments about his mother's partner, who was from Aboriginal ancestry. It appears this was not the abusive partner, but a later boyfriend. It was also reported that Tarrant expressed anti-Semitic views while in school. When he was 16 or 17, his father was diagnosed with pleural mesothelioma, a form of lung cancer caused by exposure to asbestos. His father had been exposed while on the job as a trash collector. As his illness progressed, Rodney Tarrant became depressed, and the children became stressed and anxious. Brenton coped by obsessively exercising and working out. He went on a strict diet and lost 52 kilograms, or over 110 pounds, of excess weight. In April of 2010, when Brenton was about 19 years old, his father died by suicide at home. It had been prearranged that Brenton would find his body. Tarrant was uncharacteristically quiet about this event while being interviewed by investigators after the mosque attacks. He had enthusiastically shared his life story with police and officials, but declined to say much about his father's suicide. The Royal Commission report states that, quote, he gave us an undetailed and not particularly convincing denial of involvement in his father's suicide, end quote, suggesting that there was some suspicion by investigators that Tarrant was more involved in the planning or execution of his father's suicide than merely finding the body. Lauren Tarrant, Brenton's sister, 
would engage in counseling to help her navigate issues stemming from her parents' divorce, violence in the home, her father's illness, and subsequent suicide, among other things. But Brenton received very little counseling himself. Rodney Tarrant had received a settlement of a claim for damages as a result of his workplace exposure to asbestos. Before his death, he gave his children lump sums of 80000 Australian dollars, or about 60000 in U.S. dollars. After his death, the children received money from his estate in the amount of $457,000 each, or about $330,000 U.S. dollars. No longer having to earn money for living expenses, Terrence spent his time playing video games and working out at the local gym in Grafton. He was there so frequently he qualified as a personal trainer and worked part-time at the gym for a while. It was later reported that he'd become obsessed with working out and exercising and abused steroids. In 2017, he was treated for abdominal pain in Dunedin. He told the doctor he had been taking non-prescribed oral steroids and injecting testosterone. He reported having stopped taking the oral steroids, but admitted he was still taking the injections two to three times per week. The doctor's records state that Tarrant presented with, quote, the hallmarks of steroid overuse, his face appearing rounded or moon-faced. The doctor told him that his steroid use could have long-term consequences on his health, including his heart function. When questioned later by police, the doctor said that Tarrant's steroid use at that time was most likely at a dangerous level. But Tarrant had rejected the doctor's advice, telling him that what he was doing was safe and he didn't plan to change his use of steroids. Some of Tarrant's behavior as a young man in hindsight may have been red flags of his later actions. However, Viewed separately, they were easily missed or dismissed by his family and others as possibly concerning, but not a clear-cut indication of future violence. Tarrant's online gaming friends noted his growing interest in world politics. They also said he began expressing racist and far-right views. He was especially vocal regarding immigration, particularly about Muslim immigrants into Western countries. Other concerning reports regarding Brenton Tarrant were later shared by his mother and sister. Lauren said that her brother told her that he thought he might be autistic and possibly a sociopath. He expressed to her that he didn't care about people, but knew that he, quote, should. His family saw no evidence that he'd ever dated anyone or had even been romantically or sexually interested in anyone. In 2012, he suffered an injury at the gym and quit his job as a trainer. He never held another job again and began using his inheritance money to finance his travel to many countries. He first traveled to New Zealand in 2013. This was one of the few times he was accompanied by a friend, a former schoolmate. They met up with a third friend they knew from online gaming, and it was the first time they'd met in person. Tarrant's gaming friend and his parents were avid shooters. They took Tarrant to a shooting club and on a possum hunt. This was his first experience with firearms, and he took a keen interest in the sport. After two weeks, he and his friends parted ways, and Tarrant continued the trip solo. He remained in New Zealand for approximately six more weeks. It was at this time that he visited the city of Dunedin, where he would ultimately relocate, 18 months before the mosque attacks. Upon returning to Australia, Tarrant continued his travels, driving a van around the country for nine months. Beginning in 2014, he started venturing out further, traveling first to Southeast Asia, then to China, Japan, and Eastern Europe. His travels continued until 2017, when it appeared he became low on funds. He and his sister had purchased an apartment building in New South Wales, which provided him some income, but he had burned through the bulk of his inheritance by the age of 27. By this time, he was deeply immersed in his extremist views and had decided that Muslims were a danger to Western society. Because he had nothing to lose, no money, no close relationships, no career interests or job prospects, he decided to make a name for himself by becoming a symbol of racism and hate that the world would not soon forget. But while his despicable and violent act still haunts the people of New Zealand, Muslims, and others around the world, the name Brenton Harrison Tarrant is almost unknown. Those who stood up as heroes during the attacks and those who spoke so eloquently about their loved ones at the shooter's sentencing hearing are remembered much more.
Terrence sentencing was held in front of Justice Cameron Mander at the Christchurch High Court on August 24, 2020. A month prior, the convicted terrorist had dismissed his attorney to represent himself in court. During the televised hearing, Crown prosecutors laid out the details of the meticulous planning Tarrant had conducted before carrying out the dual attacks. While the convicted man declined to make a statement before sentencing, survivors and victims' families took the opportunity to tell the court how the shooter's actions had affected their lives. Ninety people made impact statements over three days. Many asked the judge to give the convicted man the maximum sentence, life without parole. Some family members of the murdered victims expressed anger and shouted at Tarrant. Others called him a monster, a coward, a rat. Some held photos of their murdered loved ones and recited or sang verses from the Quran to honor them. Sarah Qasim brought members of the court to tears when she spoke so lovingly of her father, Abdel Fattah Qasim. She said she wondered if in his last moments he was frightened or in pain. She expressed sadness that she would have no more road trips with her father or hear him talk about the olive trees in Palestine. I want to hear his voice, my Baba's voice, she sobbed as the spectators cried with her. All a daughter ever wants is her dad. I want to go on more road trips with him. I want to smell his garden sauce cooking, his cologne. Let it be known these tears are not for you, just to clarify. Finally, she said she pitied the gunman's narrow view of the world that could not embrace diversity. Love will always win, she said, looking at him pointedly. The father of the youngest victim, three-year-old Makad Ibrahim, addressed his son's killer. Your atrocity and hatred did not turn out the way you expected, the grieving father said. Instead, it has united our Christchurch community, strengthened our faith, raised the honor of our families, and brought our peaceful nation together. The shooter showed little emotion during the hearing and did not make a statement to the court before being sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for each of the 51 murders. He was also given life imprisonment for engaging in a terrorist attack and for 40 attempted murders. His sentence was New Zealand's first ever terrorism conviction and the first time that life imprisonment without parole, the maximum sentence available in the country, had ever been imposed. Judge Mander said that Terrence's crimes were, quote, so wicked that even if you are detained until you die, it will not exhaust the requirements of punishment and denunciation. Brenton Tarrant is now serving life in an Australian prison. He has been placed in a special prison within a prison known as Prisoners of Extreme Risk Unit with only two other inmates. Eighteen guards watch over this unit, with Tarrant isolated in his own wing. His family has expressed remorse and sorrow over his actions. His uncle, Terry Fitzgerald, made a statement, saying that the family's thoughts were with the victims and survivors. We are so sorry for the families, he said, for the dead and the injured. The video of the mosque attacks were removed by Facebook at 12.30 a.m., the day after the shootings but some viewers had already shared it to other social media accounts. New Zealand police urged others not to share the video or images, saying that it would further traumatize victims' families and the public. News.com.au posted six minutes of raw footage from the attacker's video posting a warning at the beginning of the clip and faced immediate backlash from the public and authorities. As I stated earlier, many news outlets in New Zealand and a few other countries decided not to repeat the attacker's name on news broadcasts after the initial reports. They stated that publicizing his name would lead to the notoriety he craved for his cruel and evil act. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime, and that will wrap up the series Live Streamed Crimes. I'll be back with a whole new series beginning next week, and it's a doozy. This time, I'll dive into the fascinating topic of cult crimes, but from a bit of a different angle. You know how we do it at Once Upon a Crime. We're only about one month away from CrimeCon Las Vegas. Don't forget to register to attend CrimeCon in Las Vegas, April 29th to May 1st, and come see me on Podcast Row. Please make sure to use my offer code for your tickets, Once Upon 22. It helps us to pay for travel to see you in person. Thank you. If you're in the UK or would like to go to the UK, 
You can use that same offer code to get your tickets for CrimeCon UK in London. And I can't wait to meet you there. Get the info on both events at CrimeCon.com. Another way you can help us out is by becoming a Patreon member. Patreon members of Once Upon a Crime get ad-free early release episodes, bonus episodes, sneak peeks of upcoming series topics, and free swag sent to you in the mail. To find out more and sign up, go to patreon.com slash once upon a crime. There's a link in the show notes. Thank you so much. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Ludlow. My administrative and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>